You know, Gulf Star is a corporate finance investment banking boutique, uh, which means that really we, we only do advisory work. Uh, our business really is primarily uh, representation of sellers uh, in M&A transactions. Uh, and our clients are entrepreneurs. Uh, it might be the founder, it might be a family, it might be partners that started the group, but at the end of the day, uh, we work primarily with entrepreneurs. And um, the thing that I love about our business is that we're very plugged in uh, to really what I call the capital life cycle because our folks, our clients are the folks that start businesses. They create significant wealth, uh, and then we have the wonderful opportunity to help them convert that wealth into liquid assets that Michael gets to manage for them. So it's a pretty good cycle, uh, and I think it's probably as much as we enjoy doing what we do, it's probably more fun to be the client than it is to be us. Um, but, um, you know, if you think about, you know, if you put that what we do, because, you know, we all want to think about what we do being important in a, in a little bit larger perspective. Um, but, and I, I think about going home and I'm kind of challenged to explain to my children uh, what I do and why that's important. And then I step back and I think, well, that's terrible uh, because uh, all of us in this room, uh, you know, we need to be able uh, to communicate and tell people what we do because this cycle that we're involved in uh, is what makes this economy the wonderful place it is and makes this country the one that attracts people from all over the world. So the other part of my introduction, if you, you know, my students at my classes at Rice, you know, always know they have to put up with me coming in at the beginning of class. There's always, well, here's something you need to read, but this is not a homework assignment. But I think it's very important that the people in, in this room read and be able to, uh, to talk about what we do. So my, my book list for today, uh, if you haven't read Arthur Brooks' The Battle, uh, you know, check it out, read it. Uh, I like Arthur Brooks, like me. He was a, a professional musician for a couple of years and then he went back and got a PhD and became a teacher and now he runs the Heritage Foundation. Uh, but uh, he's very clear and if you haven't read Thomas Sowell, uh, read Thomas Sowell's biography and then he's got another book out called uh, Intelligentsia and in Society uh, and all of you should read that as well because um, I'd much rather take advice uh, from uh, the people in this room uh, than some of my wonderful colleagues I know over at Rice University. Um, you know, and then finally, the, the beautiful thing about this cycle is that when, when we help entrepreneurs in the way that we do, somebody comes in and not only puts money in their hands, somebody puts capital into the business, and guess what? The business grows, the business creates jobs, and when that happens, we all know what else happens, the business pays taxes and they pay a lot directly, they also pay a lot indirectly. So let me move on to the next slide here and we'll talk about, well, how is it then in sort of that global scale, how does this all really fit in? Because I think it ties very well. Our business is driven by what's going on in the credit markets because if you're gonna sell a business, the first thing you ask me is, well, what, you know, what can I get for my business? What multiple of EBITDA can I get? Uh, and it's, it's really simple to sit down and work your way through it because private equity is going to look at your business and one of the first questions they're going to ask is, well, tell me about the asset profile of the business. What's the credit quality of the business? How much money can I borrow? Uh, certainly that's not as critical for the strategics because as Michael has said, they're sitting on this huge cash hoard and they can just step in and write a check. But they're not always the best buyer. So what you've got on this first slide is looking at what's going on in sort of the credit markets as it re relates to the middle market companies that re we represent. And what you see here is that in terms of transactions that are actually getting closed, which is what this is based on, and this is also transactions in the 10 to 250 million range, which is where we work, and you'll see that total debt multiples in transactions are right back to where they were before the crash. Uh, and these two slides, the darker bar is the uh, senior portion and then the, the light blue bar is the sub-debt portion. Of course, what you can see is uh, when credit tightened, there was less senior debt, but that's when the mezzanine debt, the sub-debt guys came in and started to fill the gap. Uh, if we move to the next slide, you know, this slide is showing you what's going on, which is kind of a complement of that, because if debt's not available, private equity's got to be willing to step up and put more capital in the transaction. Private equity is always very much a financial transaction because if you think about it, if I borrow 50, 50 million and I, I put up 50 million and buy a company for 100, uh, if in four years I've paid off the debt, I've doubled my money. Because I've done that simply not by not, growing the, by, by, not by growing the business, but simply because I've deleveraged it. Well, if I double it, 
and now it's gone from two from from one to 100 to 200, I put in 50, I paid off the debt, now I've got 4x on my money. So leverage is very important, and what happens is if you have to put more equity into the transaction, then your internal rates of return are going to come down. If your internal rates of return come down, uh, the, the pension funds and the endowments that you go to uh, the next time you're going to want to raise the next fund uh, are not going to be as happy with you. So debt is very important to the private equity market, and fortunately, you know, we're seeing uh, with the multiples that I showed you and also where we're seeing what's happening in transactions, uh, we're seeing that the leverage is available to private e equity to be active. And then the next question is, well, you know, what does that mean in terms of how busy have they been and, and what's been going on uh, with multiples? And what's happened is that uh, as we've moved back into the cycle, you can see from 2008 moving forward to 2012, uh, we've seen the average multiples that are paid in these transactions come back up. The market kind of bottomed out in, in 2010, but we're right back at, at, at 6.2 times as the average. Uh, and you can also see the, the top line there is the number of deals that were actually reported. Uh, if you move to the next slide, and this is the thing that I think that, that's interesting, because it really is true, in this marketplace, there, it, it's a segmented market because the players in different levels uh, tend to stay in certain size habitats. And what happens is smaller deals are just not going to sell uh, at the same multiple that larger deals do. And it goes all the way up because we see private companies trading at lesser multiples than the publics and everybody benchmarks off the publics. Uh, but the interesting thing to me is if you look at this data, you can see that there's a very clear break point here uh, in what the market is willing to pay for companies that are 50 million and below and what it pays for those that are 50 million and above. You know, and an easy, uh, if, you know, if you just use the number that we, we talked about earlier, we're really talking about getting you into that 10 million EBITDA and up. Uh, and there's, there's just a lot more interest in companies in that size range, and that shows up, uh, as you see here, in the multiples that get paid. Uh, the other thing that I like to look at is, well, what's really going on in the middle market? Uh, and the other thing that we see here is that middle market consistently is about 30%, give or take, of the total value of transactions. But step back and look at it not so much in terms of the value of transactions, but the actual number of transactions. Because what we see is businesses are a very interesting distribution. There's a whole lot of concentration down in the lower end of the market but then you got this really long skewness out in the right side of the, tr of the tail. So there, there are fewer businesses, uh, if you will, that are up in that 30 million EBITDA and north that are in the marketplace every year. And part of this, what you see back in six and seven, is when private equity were doing a lot of these really large transactions. Uh, but what you see here is that this middle market, uh, which is where you find the entrepreneurs and we find this capital cycle of private equity putting money into companies to take them and make them two or three or four times bigger over a three to five year period of time is very, very vibrant even today. Uh, and if we move to the next slide, you know, this is giving you a look at what's going on in the private equity markets in terms of deal values in total and how busy the market has been. And there's, I don't think there's, there's really any surprise here. I mean, everybody uh, who's in the business remembers how frothy things were in 2007. Uh, and if you look at this chart and you look at 817 billion uh, getting put to work by private equity in 2007, doing over 3,000 deals, um, you know, the lawyers and, and, uh, and the investment people were very, very happy in 2007 because there was just tremendous activity. And then you can see it started to fall off. It really, we didn't feel it so much in Houston. Other, other parts of the country were feeling it a lot more than we were. But it was literally, uh, for us uh, in Houston, it was the perfect storm in the fall uh, when we had Hurricane Ike and we had the, the markets just fall right out from under us. And where we saw it uh, was uh, our good friends, the bankers. Uh, we had deals on the table and the credit just started getting pulled left and right uh, because at that point the credit market shut down and as I said earlier, no credit markets, no deals. Uh, we, we're recovering. Uh, obviously, you see uh, 2010 and 11, we've done just under 2,000 deals in total. Uh, in terms of the total capital that's being deployed, it's a little bit deceptive because we see they're deploying as much capital as they did in 2008. Uh, but what's deceptive about that uh, is that in 2008, the market shut down for, the, for about a third of the year. Uh, so I think we're still really not, I, I wouldn't necessarily say we're totally back on track. 
Um, but if you look at the little uh, graph in the upper right, because this is just saying, well, where are we this year relative to last year? Because I think what we're all worrying about is whether or not uh, things are starting to slow down. And what you can see is, you know, the activity in the first half is really down relative to where it was previously. Uh, this next slide uh, will take you into where does private equity sit today? Because that's something that we pay attention to. And what we see is they're going to be very busy. Uh, the slide on the right shows you, and you would expect this, they've got a lot of portfolio companies uh, that they acquired prior to 2008, which means those, those portfolio companies are companies they really need to get out of. They probably had expected to get out of them, but that, that was disrupted by the crash. And then on the left side, you see they've got, they're sitting on $432 billion, and that's if they didn't raise another dollar today. Uh, but they're all actively getting into a fundraising cycle again. Uh, if you look at this next slide, I was just going to close out real quick with a few comments on energy because obviously we are the energy capital. Another one of my favorite books, Eric Beinhacker, uh, things, something that everybody in Houston should pay attention to because it's the big picture. You don't create wealth without energy. Every means of creating wealth consumes energy somehow. Uh, okay, and, and, and so when we look at what's going on in Houston, we look at energy and private equity, you know, what we see is energy has always been a significant area of investment by private equity. One of the things we follow is the rig count. How's the rig count doing relative to OXX? I know there's a lot of uncertainty about the rig count right now. Uh, we're all watching it because energy services is very important to us. Uh, but one of the things I did was go back and say, well, wait a minute, what's the rig count really doing? Uh, and what's OSX really doing? And what I did, just so you can see how close it is, uh, that's the price of WTI times 2.5 is the yellow line. Uh, and so that almost perfectly overlays what's going on with the OSX index. Uh, but, you know, what the, the, the question really is, what's going to happen? Uh, and I don't think, you know, there's two ways for that gap that we're seeing right now uh, to close. Either rig count's coming down uh, or uh, we're going to see, uh, you know, oil and OSX rising. But I think that just goes back to the macro things that Michael was talking about because uh, if we've got good growth globally, we're going to see demand for oil. Uh, in a global market continue to stay pretty strong. But here's the thing that gets me. Um, the green line uh, in this graph is the ratio of the other two. So the yellow line is the price of WTI and the green lines, uh, excuse me, the, the, the blue line is the price of natural gas. What you care about is a BTU. You don't really care whether you get it from natural gas or you get it from oil. Okay? And as somebody with some economic training, this is just not something that markets will let persist. You have to pay six times for an oil BTU, what you could pay today for a natural gas BTU, okay? That has to close. There's no way. It has to close. Uh, and it will close, whether it's LNG export or whether it's construction of natural gas power plants. Doesn't really matter. That's going to have to close. And I think it's, again, I think it's going to close uh, because the price of oil is not going to come down uh, a lot. It's going gonna, it's gonna to trade. But if we've got global recovery, gl oil's a global, it is the global energy creating source of energy. Um, excuse me, wealth creating source of energy. So I think that's, as sitting here in Houston, Texas, that's what I pay attention to. And that's why I think, you know, oil service, again, not, not talking about tomorrow, but not talking about the longer term, I still think private equity is well advised to invest in oil service. So finally, since we do deals, I just thought I'd close it out with a couple of quick things there. And I won't go through all of them, uh, you know, but I think, you know, the, the, the big thing that I wanted to get to, uh, I guess I'll hit the one in the middle. Um, because I know my friend the banker is going to talk about this. It's all about quality today. Uh, even though the credit markets are back and you can get leverage, uh, underwriting standards are so much tighter. Uh, so what's not showing up in the statistics is that the, de the deals that aren't getting done because they just uh, don't have the ability to raise the debt necessary to come up with a transaction price that works. Thank you. <laughs>